we're going to go ahead and get started with the uh, panel. So um, my name is Elizabeth, um, and this is Caleb, and we're second year MUEP students, so we'll be moderating today. And I want to introduce the panelists for you. So first we have uh, Nancy Faber. She's an environmental planner with the U.S. Bureau of Land Management. Then we have Greg Davies. He's a senior transportation planner for the city of Scottsdale. We have Lissa Hall, who's a planner at Espiritu Loci. And Carol Hu, who's the senior director for research and strategy at the Greater Phoenix Economic Council. Uh, so we're going to start off with a series of questions that we have planned, and then you guys are all welcome to write down questions that you think of as uh, the panelists are answering, um, and those will be picked up towards the end, and we can ask those questions um, of the panel as well. Uh, so we'll go ahead and start um, just with a, a question about your careers thus far. So. Um, what was your first job as a new planning professional, and what did you do, and what did your career trajectory look like from there? And we can start with you, Carol. Sure. Hello? Can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. So um, my career started with um, my bachelor degree in urban planning. Um, Barbara had sent out these, you know, weekly, monthly letter of all the internship opportunity, and I saw one from Flood Control of Maricopa County where it's not, you know, originally when I looked at the list, it's like, well, flood control, I'm not sure if that's something I wanted to do, but it's a great opportunity, I'm gonna give it a try. So um, that's how I got my first internship opportunity was with the county. And what that actually led me to is uh, introduction to transportation planning as well as traditional urban planning. So once I finished my flood control, um, six months um, career kind of set up, um, they were able to give me an internship at the urban planning uh, department. And from that on, I pivoted towards economic development. And so now I'm um, doing a little bit of everything. Hello. So my first job, well, my degree is in real estate development and urban design. And I graduated in 2007. So the timing of everything, it wasn't exactly how I had planned it, but there was an opportunity with the city of Phoenix, and so I became a landscape architect intern doing site plan review. And then from there, I was able to get a full-time planning position doing site plan review in their development services. And then the economy fell apart, and um, I was able to hold on to my job and essentially uh, get a series of opportunities of unexpected opportunities. So I ended up in long-range planning where I did the form-based code. I ended up in the Parks and Recreation Department where I learned about landscape design and construction and project management. I ended up doing some planning for them. I ended up writing the Tree and Shade Master Plan. Um, and then I was able to leverage that into doing uh, street diets, so road diets, and turning Grand Avenue into a walkable street. And then from there, working on transit-oriented development along Phoenix's light rail, and then into community engagement. So it's really, my trajectory has been just kind of taking advantage of opportunities that present themselves that align with the type of work that I'm interested in, and just having the tenacity to go for it, and just talking my way into those positions and saying, hey, I may not look like I fit what you're looking for on paper, but I really do. And so just kind of talking my way and getting those positions and getting those experiences and then leveraging those into other more exciting opportunities. And now I work in the private sector doing um, entitlements, planning, urban design, as well as doing some work with nonprofits around health and equity. So there's I think that's the great thing about planning is there's a lot of amazing different directions you can go into with it and you know you just kind of follow what you're interested in and, and just take, take those opportunities. Thanks Alyssa. I'm Greg Davies, City of Scottsdale Senior Transportation Plan. I just want to thank Elizabeth and Caleb for monitoring this and, and Eileen and Barbara Trapita-Lurie for putting this event on. I think this is my fifth career fair that I've attended and it's very beneficial. I'm not going to tell you when I graduated because it was about a eon ago and I was from ASU. <laughs> Go Devils, yeah. So, and literally, this is my story. The, the week before I graduated, I went down to the city of Tempe and I walked in and I said, can I, can I talk to a planning official? They said, yeah, sure. And so this gentleman walks out and I said, 
are you hiring any planners? Because I'm going to graduate in about a week. And he goes, you're looking at them. And I'm like, so you're the only planner here. And he goes, yeah, I'm the only planner, and we're not hiring. But I didn't get discouraged because I did an internship with the state land department, which really helped me get my first job at the Department of Water Resources. That was really my first official job. So it was really in physical geography. My Bachelor of Sciences is in geography, but it took a move to East Texas to really land my first planning job, which was excellent. I was a city planner for the city of Marshall. It was about population of 30,000. Great introduction to, to planning. I was the community development block grant coordinator. I was the zoning administrator. I was a city planner. <laughs> I learned a lot real quick. And so it, that was really beneficial. I then moved on to a neighboring city of Longview, Texas as a senior transportation planner. This was even better because I was the Metropolitan Planning Organization Director, I was the Assistant City Planner, and I was the Assistant to the Development Works Director. So I got all kinds of just experience in, in fields that were really pertinent to planning. Plus I was the GIS Administrator, which really, really was my favorite and still is today. So the, those are the planning jobs that I started off on and then eventually I ended up back in Arizona and I am a senior transportation planner. Transportation planning is my discipline. It's been something that I have a passion for. It's something that I will continue to do and it's something that is very important. Transportation is a choice. It's a choice that we all make each day. So that is somewhat of a kind of a synopsis of, of me and my career. It's, it's been great. I encourage you to find what your discipline is, and we can talk more about that in a little bit. But that experience has led me to 15 years as a transportation planner, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. Hi, my name is Nancy Favor, and I work for the U.S. Bureau of Land Management. Uh, my first planning job, um, so I, I started out, I, after I graduated from undergraduate, I worked for the National Park Service, and I got into GIS. And then I decided I wanted to do more kind of bigger picture kind of stuff. So I went to grad school at the other great university to the south, the University of Arizona. And uh, studied. <laughs> tough crowd here, tough crowd. But, but um, so as part of that, uh, we were required to do an internship. And so I did an internship with a um, private planning firm. And I'd never really worked in that kind of private sector before, but I. I just loved it. It was fast paced. The people were really smart. They were doing all kinds of interesting projects. I got to work on Santan Regional um, Park Master Plan and a bunch of different environmental documents for, um, for natural resource agencies. So from there, um, after I graduated, I, I had enjoyed my work with that firm. And so I continued working with them for five years. I went to a different firm after that. And then the economy took a downturn. And um, I ended up looking for opportunities um, in the government. I was kind of anxious to get back to public service. And um, so I moved up to Wyoming and I worked in a little tiny town, Rock Springs, Wyoming. And, um, and just really fell in love with all the different amazing things that the Bureau of Land Management does. And it's a pretty interesting place to work. We um, deal with everything from pipelines to wilderness to trails to um, land exchanges and solar developments, wind farms, you name it, people want to do it, except for housing. I did talk to somebody. <laughs> we don't do that. But, uh, <laughs> but we do a lot of different stuff, and so it really keeps it interesting. And then I was able to move to my current position at the Arizona State Office with the BLM. So. Great. So we'll move on. The next few questions will cover uh, recommendations for beginning planners just like us. Um, the first question is, what skills are most critical for entry-level planners, and what are some common weaknesses that you see in entry-level job applicants? Okay, um, I can start. Um, so I started my career kind of from traditional planning. I think one of the key assets, um, when I was in school, I wished uh, I knew a little bit more was actually site planning, site plan and design, because, you know, um, not all of us get to roll out a plan and figure out this is where the building footprint is. This is what a setback expectation is. Some of these um, general site plan review and the technical skill associated to reviewing a, you know, a construction document 
I think it's a little bit of lacking um, from school. So it would be nice to have a, as an asset, um, uh, as a kind of a complementary part to your education. I'll put on my uh, private sector hat and with urban design, a lot of it's really around the program. So just making sure that you have a really strong understanding of AutoCAD, of Photoshop, of Illustrator, InDesign, um, especially if you're interested in that aspect, as well as just being confident and comfortable with hand drawing as well, because there is still quite a bit of that go that goes on in the office. Um, and sometimes you're in a meeting and you need to quickly sketch up an idea, and having that skill set is really helpful um, with being able to communicate your ideas and for those ideas to get turned into reality. So that's a skill set that we often see when we hire into our firm that folks that have a planning background don't necessarily have. And so any opportunity that you can take to learn those, those programs, and especially if you're interested in the design part of it, it's really gonna help you out and it's gonna really be a key part in getting that job. Um, if you're going into the government side, I'll let those guys answer, it's a little bit of a different skill set. So I think that's part of it is knowing what you wanna do and just making sure that you have that, that basic skill set to be able to do it. Thanks. I think the most important aspect when you get a position that wherever it's at, it's in the public sector or private sector, is, is written in oral communication. This is how we communicate nowadays, isn't it? Or phone. Which is okay, that's all right. But you gotta be able to communicate effectively through written and oral communication, especially public speaking. If you're a planner, you're gonna do public speaking sooner or later. You're gonna do it in front of a commission, you're gonna do it in front of the public at a public outreach forum, whatever it is, you're gonna do it. I mean, we're doing it right now. So in respect to that, that's really, really important. The other skill sets is really knowing the Microsoft platform. Most of you are familiar with that and understanding PowerPoint, Excel, and Word, because that's how you communicate your your ideas so that's really critical build research methods and spatial data collection and how to do that I know there's a research methods class that is probably still available like I said that was an eon ago when I graduated so I took that class and it really helped because we went out and actually did field research and spatial data collection that interdisciplinary approach to your work you're dealing with engineers you're dealing with architects you're dealing with all different disciplines <coughs> flood control people it's just Bureau of Land Management it could be the Tonto National Forest. It could be just a it could be any other type of dis discipline that's not yours. So understand, that. have an interdisciplinary approach, and the sensitivity to the distinctiveness of place. What I mean by that is like the urban fabric. Understand the city. How's the city tick? What makes the city a city? How can you make the city better? There's all different challenges that come up when you're working in the planning field, so understanding the urban fabric of a city. And then some of the weaknesses that I see when I bring on an intern is poor writing skills. We ask them to put together some reports and they're, they're, they're okay, but they could be better. So work on your writing skills, your grammatical skills. Minimal mapping skills, GIS is a critical skill to learn. I'm telling you, it's exploding, that field of geospatial technology is exploding, so understand the GIS component in regards to planning. And then an eye for detail. As planners, we're detailed people. We, we look at detailed plans. We look at specific just plan sets that are very, very detailed. So just have an eye for detail. See what could be better. See what can be changed. And so with all that, that's pretty much my, my take on that. Yeah, I definitely agree with that eye for detail and also the strong writing skills. Uh, my position, I, I do a lot of writing, I do a lot of reading, um, so I work on reviewing National Environmental Policy Act compliance documents and um, if we have new staff then they'll work on writing seg sections of those and there's kind of particular style of writing that we use for that. Um, so and. I work with various consultants that do that, and I'm kind of amazed uh, sometimes at how poor the writing can be, and it's very time consuming to revise that. So as a new person, 
you know, and that was something I spent a lot of time when I was a new planner is I knew that my boss didn't want to spend time rewriting something. So you spend that legwork and they'll really appreciate you that you've done a good job on that. And you know, solid research, uh, we get held to account for where did you get this data from? Was it the most recent data? Is it correct? Did you cite it correctly? You know, what is the source for that? So, um, so those kinds of skills, I, they're great. Um, being able to read a map is excellent. Um, we have different folks that do GIS, and so I would say for my line of work, that's not super critical that I participate in that, but knowing what, what to see on a map and how to read a map and making sure that I can, I, I'm constantly making edits and saying this map is not getting the information across in a, in a positive way. It's not conveying the information that I wanted to convey. So those are important. Um, yeah, so just good good research, good writing, those, those things are great. And any kind of communication. Also, for me, it's been great having that background with the National Park Service. I've worked with a lot of different specialists, cultural specialists, biologists, paleontologists, um, range folks, and so the type of documents that I work on are very interdisciplinary and knowing something about how they view things and what's important to them is invaluable when I need to ask them questions and clarify something in that document. So, so having having an openness to, to learning about other folks' specialty is very very helpful. Great, thank you guys. That's really good advice. Uh, so, thinking about the students that are here, there are master's degree students, and then there are also beginning to advanced undergraduates. Uh, what can the students do at each stage of their studies to prepare themselves for a career in planning? Um, so, when I thought about this question, I think no matter at what level, you know, I personally started my internship at a bachelor level, but I continue to um, finish my master in ASU, is that every opportunity, whether that's an email list coming from Barbara, or going to a planning conference, going to a uh, planning and zoning commission meetings. Um, I really try to continue to build my network and understand uh, the professional world as I continue from an intern to a planner to now a senior director. So I think throughout the career, um, your career and your education is always create opportunity for yourself. Build a professional network for yourself. Um, even if you're you feel intimidated with, oh my gosh, these guys are you know, senior planners or planning directors or uh, mayors and council members. Um, those are people too, so you get to really um, use your opportunity as a student to talk to them. And, and from that, you can really build um, a career out of it. As well as, I would say, everybody sitting here in the room is your cohort. These are your professional network, so start building that from the very start. start. I couldn't agree more with the networking piece of it. It's amazing how many opportunities come out of people that you know and the relationships that you build. The other piece of advice that I would have for you is apply, apply your planning skill set to your own life, right? So come up with a vision. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? What are you interested? And really get clear on what that is. You don't have to get detailed and and have it be very specific, but having a clear sense of the direction and what you're interested in, what roles you wanna play, is really helpful, because there's a ton of opportunities that are out there, and it's so helpful to have a framework in which to put those opportunities through and to be able to make a decision. Is this something I should go after? Is this something I should let pass? And I know that that's something that's been really helpful for me in thinking about what's my next step and what direction am I really interested in going in and it's a great skill set why not apply it to your life and instead of having your life happen you can plan it out and be a part in an active participate participant in co-creating your life and so I think that's really important and then as you're doing that process go out and talk to people interview um, professionals in the field find out about what opportunities are out there it's just it's amazing the amount of different directions that you can go into within this field. And then within planning, the skill sets that you're learning can go into so many different directions. And so just talk to people, figure out, you know, what are you passionate about and, and follow that. And then with that piece of advice, if you really wanna follow your passion, reduce your amount of depth. 
that you have because that's going to enable you to go after those things instead of having to have a certain pay you know paycheck coming in so financial freedom uh, gives you the freedom to really follow your dreams and to do the work that you're really interested in versus just doing the work that pays the bills so framework networking reduce your debt <laughs> Thank you, listen, that, that was good. I'm, I'm gonna segue right off what you said regarding finding your passion. Everybody has a passion. Find it. Find what you're passionate about. Pursue that passion. For beginning students, when you go through your classes, figure out your discipline. Is it transportation? Is it environmental sciences? Is it economic development? Is it GIS science? Is it whatever that is? Is it natural resources? Find that, that discipline which leads into your passion. Because you don't want to do something you're not passionate about, that's for sure. I can tell you I'm very passionate about what I do. I've been doing it for a while, and I'm still passionate. I can't wait to go to work. I'm an avid bicycle commuter. I can't wait to get up and ride my bike. Because I ride the network every day. I take transit. I ride the system. I see what, what needs done. I, I see things that we've done right. I see things that we've done wrong. But it's, it's the ability to check in and say, hey, I'm passionate about this. I want to be passionate. I'm going to still be passionate about it. So that's why you're here. Because we need new, new passion. We need new planners. You know, I'm, I'm on the inside. So I'm, I'm tailing off. So <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to train. I'm willing to bring in. And so I know they're, that you're all bright. And you, you have a future. For, for master's students, that commercial, TurboTax, free, 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 free. Internship, 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 internship. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's a key. It's a key component, and if you can do that, it really is beneficial, it really is. I've had about 12 interns go through the city of Scottsdale, and every one of them have landed a job in planning. And I know it's linked to the internship. I'm not saying it's, you have to do it, but it's, it's highly beneficial, just let me tell you that. So those are just some key points that are, are really important. And then when you go in the room next door, you're gonna see a table of the American Planning Association. Great, great resources, lots of opportunities, lots of student opportunities. So that is a, a tool or something you can use. There's all kinds of websites out there. Planet Citizen is another one. There's so many websites out there. Esri, Environmental Research Institute. Environmental Systems Research Institute, all about GIS, classes, free classes you can take. All that is available. So tap into it. Find your passion. Such great advice. I wish I'd heard this when I was younger. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, yeah, uh, I would, uh, I would, <laughs> then some folks uh, do planning as a career because they excel at it. I do it because I'm trying to learn those skills uh, throughout the rest of my life. So. So don't despair if that doesn't fit you. But um, <laughs> it makes me continually fascinated with good planning. I would say um, really getting to experience a lot of different environments. Um, you know, open yourself up. You'll never know. It sounds like uh, with my co-panelists here, uh, they've each been surprised at where their career has taken them. And that different experience have really contributed to, um, to new opportunities and taken them in directions that they might not have anticipated. And so, um, you know, I, when I was in grad school, I, I got very interested in the urban environment and doing different um, things there. And I could, have, I could have pursued that, that would have been awesome. I ended up going more towards the natural world. So um, there's, there's all kinds of different planning and, and you can build on those skills. The planning skills are really kind of, once you see some of, some of the universal processes, you can apply them to all kinds of different environments. So, um, so just try different things. I love the internship idea. That's a great way to experience different different settings, and definitely the networking. Um, when you're at, when you have an opportunity to meet with professionals at, at the Arizona Planning Association, other other groups, you know, ask people what they do, what do they like about their job, you know, those kinds of things, and and I can guarantee they'd love to talk talk to you about all those. Great. The next question is concerning jobs. Where should students look for job opportunities? And is there a different process for public versus private sector positions? All right, so I kind of 
since I started out first in the public sector, I would say, um, actually, this is my go-to website. Sometimes I still go on it to take a look what are the job requirements. Uh, that's uh, governmentjobs.com. So if you want to stay within the local region and go into a public sector, a lot of our cities will put internship opportunity or open position in that platform. So you don't have to go inside, oh, I want to be in the city of Tempe and go through city of Tempe to find jobs. Uh, governmentjobs.com posts most of our public sector's uh, job at one source. So once you create a profile, it's really easy to look for other opportunities and just hit, you know, modify your resume and send. So that's a really good resource on the public side. Um, from a public, private side, I would say it's really about driven off of your passion. I think you have the best chance at going to a private sector if you knew who are you are targeting. So make sure that you follow their website, look for opportunity when there is there. Um, but even if there is no opportunity posted on the website, don't be afraid to just find a connection, find someone you want to interview, find someone that may know someone else, uh, just to give, create that opportunity for yourself. If you're truly passionate <coughs> about a particular company or a particular public sector, that will make you shine. So um, that would be the two, two routes for that. I would say networking is a big part of it. So really um, starting with you know your professors and your fellow students and um, even you know your parents and their relationships and just kind of seeing you know how many different ways can you connect with people that are in the industry and that ha you know that through you know just a couple degrees of separation can connect you with someone in there and that's a great way to just kind of start that conversation and I remember when I first got out into when I was in your shoes and I first started kind of looking around for a job I went out on so many awkward I called them networking dates where you just kind of met with people and just kind of got a handle on what opportunities were out there and just making those relationships and something may not come out of that instantaneously, but it's amazing how many people I met, you know, 10 years ago still remember me and, you know, will sometimes reach out to me if there's an opportunity or something comes out of that. So, you know, building those relationships, building your network and really kind of tapping into that. It's amazing how many opportunities come out of that, especially in the private sector. The public sector is a little bit different. Um, and understanding how to put together a good cover letter and a resume is important and understanding how to get those keywords that they're looking for into your cover letter and resume is so key with getting past that first door because really um, ultimately an HR person is reviewing those a lot of times and so they're not they're looking for their keywords they have a checklist and so just kind of understanding that can get you there and it's still sometimes about networking as well, you know, and making those relationships and finding out about those opportunities. So you can't say it enough, you know, um, relationships, relationships, relationships. Yeah, Alyssa, Alyssa's right, that's so true. Networking is critical. It all depends if you want to go in the public sector or the private sector. You're going to get paid more in the private sector, probably. It all depends, unless you work for a non-governmental organization. But if you work in the private sector, you're going to get paid a little bit more. Public sector offers great benefits. It's real. St it's pretty stable. You learn a lot. You do a lot of interdisciplinary work. All the public sector jobs are listed right on the city websites. You just go right to the website and look at job opportunities. That's where they list them. Most cities list them all right there. It's a NeoGov platform, and the jobs are all available, and you can apply right there online. It's it's a lot better system than it was in the past. So the jobs for public sector are all on the city websites. LinkedIn is another great platform that I use. I've recruited several people off LinkedIn and informed them about jobs that are available because jobs come open pretty frequently within the city because people move around. It's like a big chessboard. You know, they'll, they'll go from one, one spot to the next and, hey, you're going over there now? Okay, that's cool. And we're going to go to the Maricopa Association of Governments. And I work the city of Scottsdale. You go to the city of Phoenix, city of Tempe, city of Mesa. There's just opportunities that pop up that are in the planning field. And I, in the very beginning, I said when I was about to graduate the city of Tempe, there was one planner. Well, the city of Scottsdale right now is about 15 planners. So it's a lot different. Planning is a, a lot more important. We're obviously in an urbanizing region, so you need more planners. 
You have long range planners, you have short or current planning. So there's opportunities out there. The market is really good right now and it's a great time to, to graduate or, or get an internship in planning. You also can go to the city and say, hey, I, I want to volunteer. Can I volunteer? Can I just do any type of work you, you have for me? Oh yeah, sure, we got plenty of work for you to do. <laughs> and so you can volunteer and eventually sometimes you get a job. So that's how that works. Internships, I, as I mentioned, are critical and they, they're really important. So it all depends on what, how you want to pursue it. So uh, the government's kind of, the federal government is kind of an interesting beast uh, to get into. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's not for the faint of heart, I'd say. Um, I, uh, I got my foot in the door long, long, long time ago uh, through a program called the Student Conservation Association. I was mostly, I loved to backpack, I loved to be out in nature, so I did that. It was a great experience. I worked for the National Park Service. Um, I, I look, I, people told me, this is how you go through the application process, this is how you apply to be a seasonal. Uh, you know, the government has a, we have, also we post all of our jobs on, online, we have a one application that works for almost any government agency now, which is great. Um, I've got it down, if I am looking to apply for a job, you can do it really quick. So once you've gone through that giant hurdle of putting all your life history into, well, you guys, probably not that bad at this stage, but uh, <laughs> it, 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 it asks for a lot of information. The government uh, apps are pretty detailed, but uh, so that's important. I would echo that um, if there's a particular job that you're interested in and it, it uh, for our positions, they usually put something called knowledge, skills, and abilities. And uh, so they'll put in trigger words in there. And if for my job, they would say, you know, compliance with the National Historic Preservation Act. Well, so I gotta make sure that I, I have that, those words in there because there's a personnel person who really doesn't know what this job is about and they're looking to weed out as many apps as they can to get down to the people that know stuff. So it is important to get those, get those words in there, speak to the hiring official, ask them what they're looking for, those kinds of things. Um, and also, um, we have people that go back and forth between private sector and public sector, so there's, there's some fluidity there. Uh, we use a lot of private sector employees to do work for the government, so there's, there's always, um, there's, a great, there's great opportunities in the private sector to get training that will really benefit you if you are looking to work for the federal government. And the federal government, I would put a plug in for them. Um, you know, I could probably try to get a job anywhere in the world, so if you're, if you're looking for opportunities, if you want to travel, if you, you know, the U.S. government puts people all over, and once you're kind of in that system, then it's one one huge system, and and so there's there's a lot of flexibility within that, which is nice. Thank you. So we're actually on to our last question that's planned, um, but before I ask the panelists this question. Just a reminder that you all can write down questions on the cards and there should be somebody coming by to pick them up um, fairly, fairly soon. Uh, and if not, then we'll have them pass forward and we can um, ask some questions that you guys have thought of. Uh, so last question for you guys. Um, is there any other information you would like to share with the students and uh, which you wish you uh, knew when you were in their shoes? All right. Funny enough, I wrote down ask lots of questions and don't be afraid to ask questions. So in the very beginning, it's, it's somewhat of a scary process. You never know what do I say, how do I make a good impression, but oftentimes it just leads to um, conversation. What, what are you looking for? So maybe that first person you talk to it, it isn't exactly right, but you start to get that knowledge and information in like, oh, this is what they're looking for, or this, these are the traits and characteristics. These are the knowledge or uh, skill and asset they're looking for. So as you get, um, ask more questions and just start starting the conversation can really help to build that. So even if it's not the first time, the fifth time, the sixth time, you're creating that opportunity for yourself in the long run and just keep asking the question. Um, something else a little bit different I thought about is once you do have an opportunity and you started working, I think uh, not enough planners and um, younger generation have the, um, to really know their work. Uh, once you have the, um, a job, it's like you, you guys are in school learning the latest thing, the latest knowledge. Oftentimes that's why someone hired you for these insights and unique way of looking at problem solving. 
So make sure, making sure that you know your words, that you continue to grow and stay intellectually curious. That would be my second part to that. I definitely agree with all of that. Um, you know, the taking risk part of it. Uh, it's kind of scary, you're brand new, you know. Um, I remember the first time I had to work like a 40 hour week in an office. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely a transition and it's a different world and there's office politics and there's all these kind of pieces of all of it. Um, but just have faith in your skills and your abilities. Um, be curious, ask questions. You know, this is an opportunity when you're young, like as you get older, as I'm discovering, like, um, you know, falling on your face isn't as attractive as it once was. Like, people kind of expect you to make mistakes. You know, take advantage of that. Take this opportunity in this moment in time in which you have and just learn everything you, ca you can and understand that folks know that you're coming in green. And so don't, you know, you want to work hard, but at the same time, don't allow that nerves and that scariness from seizing opportunities and running with them. I mean, that's how I've... I, it's just amazing how many opportunities have come up where I'm like, sure, there's no senior planner that wants to write a form-based code, sign me up, let's do it, and just figuring it out on the fly, right? Like, have faith in yourself. You can do amazing things, and it's incredible the impact that you can have as a planner. Like, you know, you can change the world. So if that's something you're really passionate and interested in, know that that's a possibility, and you just gotta, you gotta seize it, so. Go forth and like do good stuff, guys. No, that's great advice, definitely. <laughs> I think she mentioned earlier about the, the cover letter and the resume. At the city of Scottsdale, when I recruit interns, I re require a cover letter and I require the resume. I require the cover letter because I can see how you write. That's how. I, that's why I do that. So if I go, oh, yeah, that's good. Or the resume. If, there, if there's errors in the resume, it's not the best, but that's okay. But so a good cover letter and a great, clean resume. And I like to look at life through acrostics. So I'm, I'm gonna give you the A, E, I, O, and U, the vows of a successful career. All right, <laughs> A, be adaptable. You're gonna have to adapt to your organization, no doubt. And then E, be empathetic. If you're in the public sector, you gotta be empathetic. You deal with people all the time and they they're very passionate about where they live, and so you just have to be there, be, be there with them, and understand them, and say, yes, I know, I understand. So that's important, empathetic. I, innovative. Be innovative in your problem solving. That's critical. If you have a problem, be innovative in that, solving that. And then, oh, always be optimistic about everything. You gotta be optimistic. I think that's something that we all need to focus on, and then, Lastly, unselfish. So those are the A, E, I, O, and U's of a successful career. Now, if you want to be a hit in your organization, <laughs> you want to be honest, just like your mom said. Honesty is the best policy. Be honest. You know, if you're going to be late or something happens, call in. Say, be honest. I, have integrity. And T, this is really important, be teachable. Because that's, I'm, I'm still teachable. I learn something new every day. I learn from interns. So we're all here to learn. That's why we're sitting here today. So those are my acrostics of a successful career. <laughs> Some really good advice. Thank you. It was great. Um, I would just say uh, be passionate about what you do and take full advantage of wherever you land. It may seem like it's kind of boring or this assignment seems like, oh, this is really busy work, but it could be something that's very important to your organization, whatever it is you're doing. And if you do it quickly and you do it well and then you ask for a new opportunity, then doors open up. And you know, surprisingly in the government, um, there's a lot of opportunity to, to pursue individual you know, passions and different things that you're interested in. And you can, you can kind of work with your supervisors and management to, to do different things. So um, if you see things that you're interested in, then ask about, try to get involved in that. And, um, and the great thing about planning, one, what I, what I really loved in grad school was that my fellow planners were just the best, and they're still friends of mine to this day. Uh, I hear other grad programs, people are cutthroat, they're really competitive, 
I've never found that to be true in planning. People are really interested in helping other people do their best to make the best community. So it's a really exciting, it's a really rewarding field to work in, and um, that's just awesome. And uh, gosh, I had one more little tidbit, but uh, I just take advantage of, of things and and uh, you know look look for new opportunities. Oh, I was going to say that. Um, planning process, like I said, there's so many similarities with it, and uh, working with the public is another aspect of it. I would say, you know, try to let that stuff, the, you know, most of what you hear from the public, sometimes people write to say, wow, you really did a great job today, but a lot of times, <laughs> a lot of times, they're writing or they're calling or something because they're not so happy. So you gotta have thick skin, you gotta let that roll off, and uh, be sympathetic, be professional with them. Um, you know that's that's their issue that's very important to them and and you know turn it around you know find out more about that person where they come from that's what it makes it interesting because ultimately we're working with people that's a universal part of our job so a lot of great opportunities in planning so we have about 10 more minutes that we're gonna um, go over some other questions that people might have written down and Go ahead and bring those up if you have any. But we have one here. Um, what is one thing planning students may need to unlearn when they start the planning job? Mm. Any, anyone can start on that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think um, I, I get this often um, in the beginning where you come in fresh and the first thing you want to showcase is I know I know a lot. I learned a lot from school. This is how I think, and it tends to actually, um, from a you know people side, um, for, for your future senior, either that's your manager or superior, maybe kind of a turn off. So I would say like although you're remaining intellectually curious and know your worth, at the same time how, I, I almost think it's almost like an unlearn that don't take it go in so strong that as if you're you know. You're owning this the space. I think uh, a lot of people kind of run into that in the very very beginning. So unlearn it <laughs> in a little bit for now. <laughs> I would say is is it's the same kind of thing, but it's a lot of like as a planner. Oftentimes, I think it's we think we know all the answers and we know how to solve that problem. And one of the things I've had to learn is humility, right? Like, I only understand one slice of the pie, and that resident actually understands that neighborhood a little bit better than I do. And they may have a key or a piece of that information, a piece of that pie, that's gonna, in the end, make this a really successful project. And so, I think as planners, as designers, we're often taught a lot of hubris, and so it's just learning humility, and just learning like, the limits of your knowledge and being open to those, especially those that don't necessarily have traditional education, especially if you go into the community engagement piece of it, is there's so much knowledge out there. And so often I see planners and engineers just not open to that. And ultimately, that will undermine the success of your project. So um, being open. Yeah, that's true. You just gotta be open-minded and understand that people have their opinions and not to just block that off. Be, be open-minded. Like I said, be empathetic. Listen. Listen to people. Just sit there and listen. And, and also, I'm going to pull this back up. At meetings, everybody has their phone out and going through it. And, uh, don't, try not to use your phone in meetings. <laughs> just, it's distracting. I know we're on this phone all the time. It's just part of us. But keep that in mind. Try to not distract people with your phone. All right, so I'll put this back away. But that's just my take. On. <laughs> that's my take on just being just being open-minded, like they said. I would say uh, be patient. Um, things I learned when I was in an undergraduate I'm, are just starting to become public policy. New York is just starting to think about doing congestion pricing. And that was in the classes that I took 30 years ago. So. Um, Learn the corporate culture, you know. Um, I hear you millennials are, are very, you know, go-getter, we're individuals, but uh, you kind of got to learn to fit in with the, with the group that you're in. So um, 
it's it's not so special to stand out as an individual in your first couple of years. Later, when you're a super duper pro at whatever you do, absolutely go for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Does anyone have any another question that they want to stand up and ask? Go ahead. Hi, my name is Ashley Crociani, and I just want to know um, what are some common red flags you guys might see in resumes from college students, and also things that might stand out to you? Just real quickly for me, um, something I worry, I, I don't review a lot of things, but uh, people who hop around from job to job quite a bit, you worry, are they really going to, are they going to stay committed to this? So. I think something that I see are errors in your resume. Try not to have those. The other benefit is putting some metrics in your resume. You worked on like four or five projects. Or just something definitive I think will help in regards to your resume. Uh, with the design field, um, really thinking about the aesthetics of your resume. So making sure that even in your cover letter, in your resume that it communicates your graphic design abilities because it's amazing even in urban design how much graphic design you end up doing and so those are those little keys where if you're saying oh I'm this amazing person in Adobe and design and then you give us a word document it's like oh well clearly not so just making sure that all those things are consistent and you know it's important to sell yourself but also at the same time don't oversell yourself because ultimately you're going to show up and if you can't really figure it out you know you're kind of in a tough position so finding that balance yeah kind of to add on to that i think it's one on paper you have to make sure that everything there's no mistake um looking for the you know the keyword i, I thought it was a really good note that sometimes through the screening process you're you have to put those keywords to get your resume on the spot and and congruent to what they're looking for. But the red flag or uh, is once you get an interview, you really have to be able to defend yourself on these are your knowledge, these are your um, skill sets, you actually know what, what's, on, what's on your resume. Like don't go too far off from what, you know, what, where you're at because it's, it's hard not having experience but at the same time making sure that those are honest experiences on your paper so you could uh, defendable and it come off much easier um, during the interview process. That's where people are checking for those yellow lights, red lights. Okay, we got another question. Um, what advice do you want to give to the international students? I guess I'll have to go. <laughs> um, um, I was born in China, but I'm actually Canadian. Uh, but um, I would say oftentimes it's intimidating to be an international student. Um, just because it's much easier to be in your own cohort, um, speak your own language. I, I, I mean, honestly, it's much easier, so you really have to step out of your comfort zone. Um, we're all here to learn, and you're no different than anybody else. Uh, again, going back to creating opportunities, that you just really have to try, um, and uh, you know, making sure, like, you come to opportunity here, you participate in a planning conference, you participate in going to a meeting, uh, just show up. Um, it's not just coming to class, it's about being part of this environment, part of our community, because we are building that community right now. I don't think I can I don't, say that. I don't <laughs> no, that's, that's a great question, because we, a lot of us come from different cultures go about life differently. The American culture is it's interesting, it's very fast paced, it's driven, busy, so it's not that we expect that out of a different culture, but we gotta be open to different cultures too and, and how they, in, in their day to day lives and how they operate. But having the international student understand, okay, this is how the city of Scottsdale works and this is the organization. And diversity is great because we can learn from everybody. And so it's just, understanding how we operate and being open, as we said before, being open to different ways of doing things. Because I've had international students as interns and I gotta understand where they're, where they're coming from, their culture, how they go about what they go about and what they do and how they just live their daily lives. It's totally, it's totally different than mine. So yeah, just understanding it better. 
thing I'd say about that is we did kind of a fun exercise at a training I was in last year, and um, everybody talked about where they were an outsider in a group that they were a part of. So even if um, you're international and you feel like, yeah, it's a giant red flag, I'm totally different. Everybody's been in that situation probably, so ask them about that. Ask lots of questions. Reach out to them and, and you know, help them embrace your, your struggles with understanding what they're doing. Does anybody else have any other questions? first question is, does an international student's resume or cover letter, do we look at it and say, oh, well, yeah, this isn't jiving with what we're looking for? No, I don't think that's true. I think they, when they do submit it, it, it might be written a little differently, but it's still looked at for the same criteria in respect to in the opportunity. Now, the programs. Well, there's always we're always learning so there's there's different ways you can go about it and when you get into the organization you're gonna have to learn the organization and then but once you know once they're in then they're taught and trained in that specific, those specific ways of the organization lack of a better word and so there and there are training opportunities which we encourage which I think do help and there's other types of opportunities within the organization for people that have English as their second language. You know, my, my colleague right now, she's from India. And so, and, and she has an accent. And so she has to give presentations. And so if she doesn't feel comfortable, then when we'll assist, but she's been doing it a while, and she's, she works well, and works well for the organization. And she has a lot of insight. So I understand that there is sometimes a barrier, but We'll work through those. As far as the programs go, um, so when I was in school, I just started teaching myself, right? Like uh, AutoCAD is free for students, so you can download that. Uh, the Adobe Design Suite has um, a, a reduced pricing, and I, and I don't know if now it's true, but there used to be on all of the, in the computer labs, there were all the design programs, and so I just, I would ask my colleagues that had knowledge of it to give me the basics of it. There's YouTube of it, you know, YouTube videos, tutorials, and just kind of getting those basics. And any opportunity where I had an assignment that required some design piece to it, I just took that opportunity and started to try to use it. Um, I've learned more of it through work. Um, I took a little break from, Adobe, uh, from AutoCAD for a little while, so I just signed up for a community college class with it to just kind of enhance my skills and make sure that I understand the new program. So I think it's an all above strategy, but especially if you're interested in going into more of the design realm of planning, those, having a good handle on those programs, that's your foot in the door, because that's what you're, they're looking for, um, is the ability for you to be able to do an AutoCAD you know, drawing, be able to do a rendering or an illustration, and so, the more you have experience with that, the more likely you're gonna be able to get those types of jobs and those types of opportunities. So on the program side of it, I think it's, you know, you start in school and you have capstone and these mini projects, either a project you started yourself or for a school class project. I see that as an opportunity to really build that framework. It may not be a professional experience, it may not be a full-blown master plan, but that's, the framework that you need. So every time, whether that's in in work, you're you know building off of learning from work or learning in school, is that um, I would recommend just whatever your starting basis is, just build off of it. Have an open mind so that 
uh, if you have done a you know class project, it's kind of similar. Like um, everyone else here has said, planning in some ways, there's no matter which specific area you go into, there's common themes and common ground. So every opportunity that you get to learn this, you just apply it to the next project and build off from that. Um, from kind of that international um, standpoint, I actually kind of have a different take. I do think it's more difficult. Language barriers um, is challenging. I mean, we live in an English-speaking um, <laughs> uh, country, so it's it's difficult if you have an accent or a language bar barrier, but that shouldn't prevent you from um, going and applying for a job. And maybe um, something beyond just making sure that on paper you look good is creating opportunities for those face-to-face -face interaction because you as a person would um, have skill sets that, um, that may not directly translate from a paper or language perspective. So um, I would say keep trying on that. Have one more question right here. So, what's been most surprising to you uh, as planners, like working that you didn't expect at all as students, aside from you know technical things like AutoCAD and everything? I think uh, <laughs> uh, planning is such an open, wide subject. Um, I, I had a very distinctive. When I was in school, I wanted to do traditional planning, land use planning, zoning. That's all I want to do. I want to do site plan design. Uh, but where it took me is now I'm in economic development. I'm doing, looking at business strategies, marketing intelligence, what, how this cityscape look like from a business perspective. And it's totally different than what I originally envisioned. So I think those are just unexpected element of planning. You never know where where your first job's going to get you and where that's going to ultimately take you. I'm still, you know, in my way, uh, you know, in in the middle of everything. You know, I started from flood control, which is more environmental planning, regulatory side. I mean, it's just so <coughs> open wide that you never really know. It's just about finding your passion and where you fit. I would agree. I think it's just it's amazing the the different opportunities and avenues that you can go into. Um, I have tr I've struggled with like picking a niche and like delving into it because all these other opportunities kind of come up and I'm like, oh man, landscape design and park planning that sounds fascinating. Writing form based codes and learning about urbanism, designing streets. I mean, it's just incredible the range of different opportunities that you have and the different directions that you can go in. And I think what's really important is, you know, we said, I think all of us have said this, is knowing your passion and what you're really interested in. And it's incredible the doors that open. And the other cool thing that I found is how open other planners are. And uh, I'm a big fan of like Andre Stolani. I think he's like a rock star in the planning world. And like you can totally go up to him and have a conversation if you go to the Congress of New Urbanism. And same thing with Jeff Speck and these people that like, you know, I hold up on this on this pedestal. They're really available, and it's amazing if you are willing and have the tenacity, the opportunities that are in front of you. And it doesn't say that, you know, you don't have to put in um, some hard work and some long hours in order to do it. But there really is this incredible spectrum of different directions that you can go in and some really amazing and incredible work and relationships that you can build with all of it. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm just constantly surprised like, oh, I'm working in health now. Like, this is amazing. Like, and so, and also staying on top of the trends too, I think that's been really helpful. Um, you know, what's kind of trendy, sustainability, health, you know, and it's amazing how your planning skill sets can kind of shift with all of that. So, and just making that case of saying, hey, this skill set fits this. How about I take this off? You know, how about we work on this opportunity together? So. Yeah, those are great points. You know, it really blew my mind when I still think about it is the, the disconnect between health and planning. When I first started doing planning, there was no connection. But now it's a lot better. I was like, man, we really missed that one. Because <laughs> so, that's what we do, we promote, promote active transportation. And my colleague here, Mercedes, I mean, we, we promote the active transportation network, walking, biking, taking transit. And so the other aha moment I got when I've, I've been a planner was the impact of federal legislation mm -hmm. just blows your mind. 
Everything is linked back to the federal government. The Federal Highway Administration, the Federal Highway Acts, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Clean Water Act. All this legislation, it all trickles down to the very, very lowest level of the municipality because our mass tr transportation plan is required to get federal funds because the Maricopa Association of Governments is required to have a regional transportation plan because they can't get federal funds. So it all comes, it's like, wow, this is all linked together. This is all, and it makes sense. It's like, some, they, they're thinking back there. And so <laughs> it, it, there is a lot of bureaucracy and there's a lot of players, but you'd be surprised in how that federal government, the, the influence they have, even on my day-to-day -day work because we go for a lot of federal grants for our projects. But and on the municipal level, I think that's the funnest planning environment because you get, you get to see things get done. Like we have a complete streets policy in our transportation master plan. So I'm over three projects of complete street projects that are really exciting, that are federally funded. So there's a lot of strings attached. That's my problem. A lot of strings <laughs> attached. There's strings everywhere. But, and there's all different colors of money that are out there. But so that you, you got to learn all that. So what, what you're learning in, in your classes regarding federal legislation is super, super important. Super important. And I know Nancy could probably talk another hour on that, but anyway, it's really important. It has, that's interesting you bring up the federal aspect because uh, it's been a very exciting, interesting time. This last administration has made a lot of bold changes in direction and um, whatever your political perspectives are, some are, you know, some of them are very exciting because things have, have gotten They've changed how, how my job works and how involved my leadership is in, in my day-to-day -day job. And um, so I, I think more than ever I realize, yeah, I work for the executive government, uh, the branch of the executive government, and, and things change, just like he said. And uh, new laws come out and, and policies can, you know, things, things can change quickly. So um, that can be exciting and, um, and that kind of segues into what I was going to say. Maybe a surprising thing with planning is that sometimes it things like seems like things take forever to get anywhere, and like oh, it kind of stalls out. And then suddenly, some political leadership will get behind it, and they'll push. And man, things can change really rapidly. And so it's it's uh, good ideas. They they don't die. They they kind of simmer. They might get pushed aside and favor some other stuff. But but have faith and. Um, and they'll usually bubble up to the surface again. So it's kind of interesting that way. Well, thank you all so much for being here today and sharing your advice and knowledge. Let's give our panelists a big round of applause. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure if you guys are sticking around for the career fair, but hopefully if you have more questions, you can come and find them. Um, and thank you all for coming. And uh, don't forget to go down the hall and check out the career fair. There's a bunch of books there, so thank you.